Anyway, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, be Sabbath. I'm looking forward to this Sabbath day, this whole weekend. You know, finish up our training in biblical counseling and all that. And it's just always good to see you guys, and it's a beautiful day. So, anyway, I'll just uh, start with an opening prayer. Our Father in heaven, we we thank you so much for all of your blessings. We thank you that uh, that you sent your only Son to die for us, to wash away our sins, so that we can be reconciled to you and spend the rest of eternity in your presence. We just ask you to come here today while we celebrate the uh, Sabbath that you initiated at creation, and just uh, ask you to please. Uh, be here with us, send your Holy Spirit among us, and let us enjoy our fellowship with you and with one another. In your name, Jesus. Amen. With everybody. All right. Our scripture reading today is 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Let's see here. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Right. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing everybody together today. I pray that you would be with us and let everything go just according exactly to your will. Uh, let us have peace in our hearts and let your peace be with us. Uh, please cleanse us of anything that doesn't bear your fruit and protect us spiritually and physically. And be with everybody who is here today and who cannot be here today. Um, please protect everybody who is trying to attend our um, Bible counseling sessions and those around us. Um, please let us see your glory in everything you do today and let us see the things you want us to see and hear the things you want us to hear and do the things you want us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our God is an awesome God indeed, and uh, today um, I would just uh, like to uh, go through a a uh, lecture that I basically plagiarized so to uh, use as this sermon, uh, and it uh, talks about uh, how we we can know and how we can also show other people that he is God indeed, that he is awesome. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, say for the people that will be viewing this later on video, I'm going to uh, uh, send a screenshot to our technical director here, and uh, he's going to include it at the bottom of the, uh, or right after the uh, video when he posts it. And basically it's... Uh, a uh, link that you could type in and find uh, basically the uh, sermon notes that I put in uh, copies of in the bulletin for everybody and that I'll be preaching out of. And so they'll have that while you're watching this later. Anyway, um, like I said, I, I kind of uh, plagiarized this from a guy named Craig Hazen. Um, I first saw him do this live when I was still living in Southern California and attending every single apologetics and theological uh, event that I could find. And uh, I was just so impressed by it. I was just stunned. I, I just thought it was just great. Um, of course, I thought that a lot when I go to these lectures. And uh, But I remember this one... Um, I remember that when I first saw the Kalam cosmological argument presented, um, I that was probably the one that uh, I just went the most crazy over. I mean, once I got it, I remember sitting there at the beginning of the lecture, and uh, I was fairly new to these things and, and apologetics and reasoning and using logic, uh, which you know I've never become great at that, but then I was barely 
introduced to it. And I was sitting there at the beginning of the uh, cosmological argument presentation, and I was I was getting angry because I couldn't keep up, and I was just like, I, I noticed the person uh, presenting, you know, doing the lecture kept looking at me. You know, I, I think I was just, you know, I had a really angry look on my face. And he's probably wondering, should I do a signal for them to call security or something? But but I was just saying to myself, slow down, slow down. I can't, I'm not getting it. But, you know, I hung in there. By the end of the uh, lecture, I was like, oh, I get it. It's, it's wonderful. It's it's beautiful. It's, it's elegant. I just, you know, and uh, it almost became kind of a little bit of an idol for me. But, um, you know, if I'd hear someone challenge the cosmological argument, I'd be like, how dare you, you know? But uh, this was the next, the one that, uh, the second most impressive uh, apologetic, you know, method that I, behind the cosmological argument. But anyway, like I said, it's from a guy named Craig Hazen. And uh, along with that link um, that, uh, you, you can go to, and I did not put it anywhere in the sermon notes, but if you just type the text string, um, let me make, look at my phone and make sure I got it right. Craig Hazen, just Hazen is spelled just like it sounds, H-A-Z-E-N. And if I, you probably want to put that in quotes, Craig Hazen in quotes, or otherwise you'll get uh, a bunch of stuff for... Uh, William Lane Craig and others, which is good, but you know, but that's not it. So you, Craig Hazen in co quotes, can put the evidence for the resurrection, and then put PDF after it, and you'll get the sermon notes. Or if you leave the PDF off, or you could put uh, YouTube. You you will get to the YouTube presentation, and you can watch that. And and and, and Craig Hazen is a, a really great public speaker. He's really, really smart and really and a very devout Christian and uh, really knows his stuff. And he's, and he's also really entertaining. So, I mean, you could watch that and then you'll be saying to yourselves, you know, why, why do we even bother listening to Leland? He doesn't entertain us like that. He kind of bores us, you know, but, but uh, so do that after I do the sermon. But anyway, um, yeah, I'll be. If you open your sermon of your your inserts, and you look at the page where it says Christian apologia, the staple the staple piece, it says Christian apologetics at the top. That's what we'll be going through. And uh, for those of you who are, are looking ahead. And I've seen the page that says 12 known historical facts. And you see one of them, it looks kind of troubling to you as a Sabbath keeper. You don't have to worry. You know, when we come to that, I'll have something to say about that. You can be sure. So, but uh, uh, overall, this is a really, really excellent, excellent uh, uh, presentation. And it was developed be uh, at a time when... Um, you know, people were no longer impressed by the traditional uh, method of, of of showing that Christ did live, that he did die for us, and, and that he did, you know, resurrect from the dead. Basically, what you would do is you'd go to the scriptures, and then you would show uh, that, you know, the evidence, archaeological evidence and all the other evidence shows that scripture is reliable, that it is a, a reliable historical record of what did happen and uh, and that uh, we, we, we can be confident that uh, it, is, it, it gives us the truth. And uh, in fact, let's go to... With the the um, scripture verse, I probably should have used our scripture verse. It's Luke, just the beginning of Luke, and uh, because that 
shows uh, um, that this this really is indeed the Bible really is indeed a historical record, and that uh, it uh, uses primary source evidence and primary source witnesses, and uh, we uh, it, and and in fact Luke shows that I think I think, and I've seen people show that the first four verses of Luke uh, indicate to us that uh, this may have been the beginning of modern historical methods. Not, he wasn't the first historian, but maybe he was the first modern historian. So the first four verses of Luke are, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. You see there, you know, the, he's talking about, you know, someone, people have been trying to compile uh, a record of what happened, you know, during Jesus' ministry. Anyway, they accomplished among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Word in, in my Bible is not capitalized. It just basically means uh, gospel. And in verse 3, Luke says, It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning. See, he's investigating these things. And so he can compile a record to hand down to us. To write it out for you in consecutive order, which is one of the hallmarks of modern historical methods. You know, back in the ancient times, they didn't worry too much about, you know, getting chronological, you know, accuracy. They just worried about the narrative. But anyway, investigating everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So, at one time, you know, they would um, go to the, uh, the scripture and, and, and all of the uh, historical records that show that the scripture is accurate. Um, and then they would show that the scriptures clearly state that Jesus did die on the cross and that he did resurrect from the dead. And that's what this is all about, you know, the evidence for the resurrection. Well, um, at the time this was, I, I first saw this presentation, uh, the Jesus seminar was in full flow. Do you remember the Jesus seminar? Yeah, they were um, basically a group of so-called scholars that, uh, well, as your notes say, that uh, um, their primary goal was to debunk the Jesus of faith and replace it with the Jesus of history, in their view, and a version of what really happened. Well, if 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 you know anything about the Jesus seminar, they they weren't all scholars and a lot of them, you know, remember one of them was, you know, they would, they would, they wouldn't go to the evidence and the historical record and archeology span and all the other ways we can uh, determine the, the reliability and, and, and uh, accuracy of scripture. They would basically vote on it and they would, uh, uh, and they were from a broad spectrum. They weren't even all Christians. Um, much less Christian scholars or biblical scholars. But um, I remember one in particular was a woman who was a Buddhist. And they would ask her, you know, well, when you vote, you know, you know, whether this, you know, they would vote on whether certain, you know, verses of scripture accurately described what really happened or not. And they'd ask her, you know, when you vote, how do you decide what to vote? She said, she was a Buddhist. <laughs> so she said, I just meditate and then I know. And, and that sounds silly, but that was where we were at that time and where we still are, really. People just basically say, well, the, the Bible is just, it's just a, uh, 
a, a bunch of, you know, it's a bunch of religious beliefs based on, you know, blind faith, you know, just what you want to believe. Like, like just about every other religious belief. You, but Christianity is unique. We go to the evidence. We want to uh, know that this really happened because all of our faith hangs on, you know, one little spider's thread of truth. And that is that Jesus did die and did raise again from the dead. Now, I've heard that spider's web, the little thin little spider's web that the Christianity, our faith hangs by, described as, you know, basically this undestructible thread of, you know, however thin it is, you know, and, and, and they described, you know, at the bottom underneath this thread on the ground are all the broken weapons that people have tried to, you know, assail this this thread of truth with, you know, and the broken clubs and battle axes and everything else. It just, but, you know, and they, for 2,000 years, that basic truth has been assailed and it has never been disproven and it has gotten more and more robust. But <laughs> anymore, people are not, people in general just not impressed with scripture. They just, they see you get a Bible out, and if you go to the uh, video of, of Craig Hazen's presentations, he makes a big deal about this. You know, they they see you get out a Bible, and they think, "Oh no, no, the Bible's evil. It's full of racism and transphobia and homophobia and you know, just you know just bigotry and, and you know." They, so they 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 won't even open their minds to it, even. The so-called scholars, the people that have made Christian and history and, and scriptural history their their profession, they um, uh, Craig Hazen also tells of, of uh, him watching a documentary of Jesus' life on I think it was the Discovery Channel or something like that, and he was actually impressed. It was it was pretty good, but. They got to the part of the uh, crucifixion, and they had a, a panel of scholars. Almost all of them are like ranging from liberal, you know, biblical scholars to radical biblical scholars. Except for two of them were pretty conservative, and he thought they held their own pretty well. But all of them agreed on one thing: they all agreed, based on the evidence, both scriptural and otherwise. That Jesus, a you know, man like named Jesus Christ, did live. He did have a ministry. He was crucified and he did die on the cross. And he was buried. But then, you know, they did the next segment on the resurrection. And um, every single one of them, except those two conservative Christian scholars, said, well, how can you really know what happened a long time ago? It was just, you know... Uh, a lot of, you know, crazy stuff was going on all the time anyway. And that's when he realized, you know, even in academia, it wasn't about evidence or truth. Because just before they, they said, you know, that based on the evidence, Jesus did live. He, he did die on the cross and he was buried. And he said, all you have to do is, go, you know, that same evidence, you just turn the page and it's the same documents and the same biblically and non biblically indicate that he rose from the dead, you know. So basically, um, a couple of uh, colleagues of Craig Hazen's came up with this. Um, they were they're basically trying to figure out what to do. Uh, since no one, you know, books like uh, Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict uh, and, and uh, stuff like that weren't really, people weren't really taking that seriously anymore just because of the source. Just like if it's from the Bible or from Christians, scholars, it's suspect. So basically what they decided to do is, well, let's read all the skeptics, the skeptic scholars. Uh, read their 
material. Find out what they do believe did happen in history, as far as it concerns Jesus Christ and his ministry and and and, and his death and, and burial and all that. And they said, and then let's see, you know, we won't use biblical sources. We'll we'll use what everybody, Christians, skeptics, radical skeptics, everyone agrees that these are historical facts, points of facts. And let's see what kind of conclusions we can draw just from that. And uh, basically, you just try to see what explanation fits all of that. And since nobody wants the primary source evidence from the New Testament anymore, we'll just, we'll just use their stuff. And they narrowed it down to like 12 points of historical fact that everybody agreed on. Everybody. And these were Jesus died by crucifixion. He didn't hang on the cross a while and then somehow survive. He didn't just pass out and then, you know, revive when he, after he was taken off the cross. He died. Number two, Jesus was buried. Now, that these are very, very terse. They, they don't go into any kind of detail because, you know, people will disagree on the details, but, you know, so they just go with these. Number three, Jesus' death caused the disciples to, to despair and lose hope, believing his life had ended. By the way, I'm, I'm working off the top of the page four here. Now, the disciples had experiences, for number five, disciples had experiences that they actually believed to be literal appearances of the risen Jesus Christ. And then what he considers, and I, I consider to be the strongest of these points of historical fact, number six, the disciples were transformed from doubters uh, who are afraid to identify themselves with Jesus to bold proclaimers of his death and resurrection. I mean, bold even in the face of, of the threats against their own life. They were willing to die to let people know that this had happened. So they had gone from hiding in the upper room, you know, with the doors locked, you know, wondering when, you know, the, the Jewish you know, authorities would come to arrest them and being afraid, to all of a sudden, no, they're, gonna, they're not going to wait. They're going to go out there and they're going to proclaim, hey, he was the Messiah. He did what the Messiah was going to do. It wasn't what we expected, but it's what he was always intended to do. And we are now saved if we will just believe in him. So I, I thought when I looked at number three through six on this, I was thinking of uh, that uh, old Tony Campolo sermon. You know, it was like, it was Friday, but it was about to become Sunday, you know, Friday, they were hiding and they were scared and they were, didn't know what to do, but pretty soon it was going to be Sunday and they knew exactly what to do. And they did it fearlessly. Now, number six is powerful, I think, because, you know, what kind of things are, are people willing to die for? What kind of beliefs are people willing to die for? Or what kind of claims are they willing to die for? What kind of claims are they willing to make not, that will not only put their lives at, in jeopardy, but the lives of their loved ones, their friends, their community? It, it's not, it, it's not uh, something they know to be a lie or that they know that you can't know. 
People don't do that. They, you know, if 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 they if they're trying to run a scam, kind of conspiracy, you know, and and it's like if you start to, you know, say, well, okay, and you're gonna dip them in boiling oil, you know, about the time the toes are about to hit the oil, they're okay, 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 okay. I made it up. All right, you know, they don't sacrifice their life. Usually, I mean, there'd be occasional lunatics that are out of touch with reality in, in general, but not masses of people. And I thought of a like the, the example of Jonestown. Remember the Jonestown massacre, Jim Jones, and all that. Now, that was a case where people should have known better. But they did believe, they sincerely believed. They not only were willing to die, they killed each other over it. I mean, the ones that, whose faith in Jim Jones was weak when he started, you know, making them drink poison, they, when, the ones that tried to run ended up with a uh, syringe full of, you know, cyanide stuck in their back, you know, by the true believers that weren't going to let them go. I, I, I saw a documentary of, of Jim Jones and the Jonestown massacre, and, and, and they were interviewing a woman who wasn't there. So she didn't die, but she uh, she said she actually helped Jim Jones fake a bunch of healing miracles. She helped him do that. But, and this is what killed me, is like she knew that he also did perform genuine healing miracles. I'm like, huh. How can you believe that? I mean, but she did. And that's why she was willing to follow Jim Stone. Look at Heaven's Gate. Remember them? They were the ones that uh, neutered themselves and, uh, you know, uh, were waiting for the hale -Bopp comet to come to the Earth because they thought there was a spaceship hiding behind it. And then, you know, they would commit mass suicide and they would go up to the spaceship. And I'm, I was thinking, you know, well, if you if you're going to be dead, you know, why do they need a spaceship to pick you up? You know, it's like, but you know, people can be gullible sometimes and incredulous, and they really did believe they didn't. They didn't die because they thought it might be true, or that they that that, that they thought it was a scam that they were getting away with. Anyway, let's move on. I got to keep moving or because this sermon could get real long real easy if i'm not careful anyway number seven this message was central to the preaching of the early church the message of the resurrection and as craig hazen points out there, there are a whole bunch of things that could have become central to the preaching of the early church but those didn't. The resurrection did. And everybody agrees about that. Biblical scholars, skeptics, everyone. It was especially proclaimed in Jerusalem where Jesus died and was buried only a short time before. This wasn't a case of, you know, something happened in Jerusalem and then everybody scattered and went to other parts of the Roman Empire. And over time, over a generation or two, they started, you know, embellishing what had happened and a legend developed it. There wasn't time for a legend to develop it. Had, they were proclaiming Christ's resurrection immediately. As a result of the preaching, the church was born and grew. Boy, did it ever. Now, he points out that there, there's a lot, you know, Christianity didn't really, it wasn't really well positioned to grow like that so you know something had to explain it you know other religions had a were better position to like, like islam you know but they didn't grow the way christianity christianity was a, a a religion of persuasion from the beginning islam you know you just raise an army and conquer but number 10 the one you probably are like looking at and say leland what are you doing it's like um like I said, I'll have, I'll have something to say about that. I consider it to be the weakest point by far, and, and one that's not necessary and doesn't do that much to help and wouldn't 
matter if it wasn't there, but number 10, 10 and but keep in mind, well, I'll read number 10 first. Sunday became the primary day of worship, especially powerful considering early believers were all Jewish. They were all Sabbath keepers. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that, but uh, it just, well, let me, let's read 11 to 12 real quick first. James, formerly a skeptic, and Jesus' brother, was converted to faith when he also saw what he believed to be the resurrected Jesus. And then later, number 12, a few years later, Paul likewise was converted by what he believed to be an appearance of the resurrected Jesus. And we know, all know about Paul's ministry, you know. He did like all the others. He joined them and he sacrificed his life just like the others. But anyway, before we move on, let's go back to number 10. Now, like I said, I think it's the weakest data point. Um, but, but keep in mind, it's just a historical data point that's there because everyone believes it. All the scholars believe it. It's, it's not really an argument against the Sabbath, or at least it wasn't presented in here for that. I mean, uh, much as Craig Hazen and all the others, a multitude of others that, at whose feet I sat for so many years and, you know, was you know, benefited greatly during my coming of age as a Christian, all, virtually, virtually all of them are not Sabbath keepers and would argue with you that, you know, it's not. I <laughs> commandment anymore, really. But that's not why that's in here. So keep that in mind. That's just one of the things that even the skeptics agree with and that did happen. But like I said, um, it doesn't, to me, it just doesn't do the work to support the resurrection that the other points do. You know, like... Just go through the other points real quick and say, you know, what if those things hadn't happened? I mean, think about how, you know, much they do to, to show that Christ did raise from the grave. It wouldn't do anything, really, I think, if number 10 was not there. It wouldn't, like if... Any of the others, look at number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. What if that hadn't happened? No, we wouldn't be here talking about it at all. The other stuff wouldn't have happened either. What if he had never been buried? You know, the, one of the uh, arguments of the skeptics is, well, we don't think the Bible, you know, is accurate there. We think probably he was just buried in a common grave or just thrown in a pit somewhere. And dogs ate his body so the apostles didn't know what happened to his body, so they just developed this legend. But, you know, if he'd never been buried to begin with, well, you wouldn't have, uh, well, if he'd never been crucified, number three wouldn't have happened. Jesus' death wouldn't have caused its disciples to despair. Or what if he had died and they just hadn't worried about it? You know, I don't think Christianity would have developed. What if they'd never found? The empty tomb. What if the disciples had never actually, you know, never had experience that they thought was Jesus appearing to them? Of course, if ne number six had never happened, we wouldn't be here. No, if, if any of the others hadn't happened, it, it really would affect, have affected uh, the outcome. And we wouldn't have much reason to believe in that the resurrection is true, but that's not true of number 10. In fact, uh, and it also doesn't uh, help us. I mean, it doesn't, for us, um, like, I can see why they put it in here. But for us, like, if you go, you know, we go by what the Bible says. And, you know, go to Genesis. Chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. 
By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. In other words, God sanctified it from the very beginning, from the beginning of creation. And the fact that later, you know, after Jesus' death, and it was actually a while after his death, it didn't happen right away, uh, they started worshiping on Sunday. And there's other, you know, reasons why they would do that other than that Jesus was, you know, resurrected on Sunday. And of course, you know, we could look at uh, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. And we could look at Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. That's basically the, the Sabbath commandment. You know, the fact that the apostles, well, I don't think the apostles did start keeping the Sabbath or, or meeting for worship on Sunday. I doubt that happened. Um, I just haven't seen the evidence, either scripturally or otherwise. But it did happen. And it happened earlier than a lot of Sabbath keepers would like to believe. I mean, a lot of people say, well, no, Constantine, you know, ordered that, you know, when he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, he ordered that they would keep the uh, Sabbath on Sunday because that's when all the pagans were, you know, so they wanted to unite people. Well, first of all, if I remember correctly, Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. All he did is legalize it. Before that, we were persecuted. And later when he did, I think he did, if I remember correctly, decide to uh, do what the Christian who attended the councils that uh, compiled the Bible and other Christians wanted him to do. I say, you know, like we got to do something about these Sabbath keepers. They're just, they're Judaizing. They're wrong. We can't have this. But that, that, that wasn't the beginning of Christians keeping the Sabbath on Sunday or meeting, or at least meeting for worship on Sunday. It happened a long time before that. Probably early in the second century, it was starting to happen, you know, sometime shortly after the year 100. I doubt it happened before then. I don't see any real evidence that uh, any of the apostles during their lifetime or even the apostolic generation that uh, had, had started keeping the Sabbath. You know, and, and then when you look for scripture, I, I we could go through them, but we won't. We can do that another time. This isn't a uh, sermon about the Sabbath, but I mean, you could go through there and see none of the books seem, you know, I just don't think, you know, maybe the book of Revelation, because that did, I don't think that was, you know, I mean, that might have been written when some, you know, after John was, or after people started keeping the Sabbath uh, or more and more, but I doubt it. So don't worry about that. You know, it's, it's okay to be in there. Like I said, this is not an argument uh, against the Sabbath. This is just a, a point of a data point of history that we use to show the skeptics that even their beliefs show that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I won't keep you too much longer. The uh, if you want to get out this sheet, it has the chart on it on the one side. The other side, it has the case for Christianity, and it'll list basically what uh, I think the gospel and his textual and historical analysis, the gospel, you know, is validated. And on the other side, it says it lists the 12 known historical facts concerning the resurrection. But on the flip side, like I said, this is a chart. And, and, and Craig Hazen is done two things. Uh, first, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, it's, it says, if if there's not enough data to make a judgment, period, and a little finger pointing, then throw out most of what we know about classic antiquity. Because that's, 
it's the same data. It's, it's the same source. But anyway, the, the chart, it's not a family tree. Well, it looks like one. Uh, it's the tomb of Jesus was either occupied or empty. And then it goes down and it tells you all the, you know, skeptics challenges to the uh, resurrection as history. And I won't go through all these because um, you have them. You can go through them at, their, at your leisure. Um, but some of them are just kind of fun, you know, like, uh, uh, well, the unknown tomb. That was, you know, that's, you know, that's like what? That, that's the one where they think he, you know, got thrown in a pit or and his body was eaten by dogs or something. And, it, and the numbers below those show the data points that contradict these challenges. So basically 4 through 12. You know, it just, uh, maybe it, if uh, he had never been buried uh, or they don't know where he is buried, it doesn't, it isn't challenged by the fact that he died by crucifixion or that he was buried. And it doesn't really show that the disciples, you know, went into a, you know, a deep depression over it for a while. But all the other data points contradict that, that notion. Uh, some of the others of my favorite ones are like the twin theory. And uh, that's the, you know, that Jesus had a twin. Yeah, and Mary didn't know that either. And uh, James didn't know his own brother. None of his brothers and sisters appear, appear to know because there's no historical record of them saying, wait a minute, I know him. He's He's the long lost twin. He doesn't, you know, but, uh, but it, it, even, the, you know, but that's biblical. The, the skeptics, you know, they're just number four and 11, I think. The tomb was discovered to be empty a few days later. Well, if it was a twin that got crucified or a twin that after Jesus was crucified appeared and said, Here I am, I'm Jesus, they, they would have probably just gone to the tomb and said, Wow. And then say, wait a minute, there's someone in there. And number 11, you mentioned James, you know. He wouldn't have been fooled. Another one that's uh, just kind of fun is, you know, hallucination. You know, it's mass hallucination. Well, first of all, m hallucinations, mass hallucinations of that order just do not happen. Uh, the one I've heard about that people say might be a mass hallucination although it might have had something to do with ergot poisoning, was the uh, the, the girls that uh, were accusing people of witchcraft at, uh, in Salem in the witch trials. And that was like half a dozen girls or something. But um, Jesus was, you know, he, before and after his death, he preached, you know, before his death, he preached to thousands and thousands afterwards for, for 40 days after he was resurrected. He appeared and he, you know, talked to people at one at one event alone, you know, there were 500 heads of households and their families all there that he was interacting with. And it shows you um, the disciples stole the body. I mean, you know, it was guarded. Um, or at least, but that's biblical, so maybe they could say, well, maybe it wasn't guarded. But if it was guarded, you know, a, a Roman guard was a not just a couple sleepy old guys that had to pull guard duty that night. It was always at least a you know a squad, a decade, ten guys, and 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 if they had let someone come in and steal a body, the Romans crucified you know traitors and really annoying criminals, and they also crucified soldiers if you for dereliction of duty. But uh, but uh, anyway, if you could see there that. Uh, uh, it, it it doesn't explain, you know, a number of data points in here. Basically, what it comes down to, you know, is if you look on the tomb was empty side, you'll see natural explanations and supernatural explanations. And uh, the one natural explanation that I see on here and then that I, you know, there's the most amusing 
but according to Craig Hazen, in a way, all the data points fit is Jesus was an alien. He's like, he came down from space. And, and you know, people have pointed out before that, you know, any, you know, super highly technologically advanced people, you know, showing, you know, using their technology in front of, you know, much, much, much more primitive people will be, appear to be like, it'll appear like magic to them. And uh, they, uh, so they okay, they would be fooled. And, uh, but there's one other point I'd like to make about that that is important, I think. If Jesus was an alien and he came down and, and, and you know, was either invulnerable to being killed or it replaced himself with an android and then showed up after he died or whatever. How would you test that? How would you test that? That's not a scientific theory. It's kind of like some of the uh, theories that try to challenge a plumb cosmological argument or the Big Bang theory. They'll talk about, you know, the, all these other, they're weird. They're like talking about other universes that, you know, where causation is not a thing and maybe ours popped out of that one. But you can't test that. You could only study the universe we are in. So there's no way to, and in, in science, if something cannot be invalidated, it cannot be validated. That's how you validate a theory. You test it, you challenge it, you try to invalidate it. And if it holds up, it's good. If it doesn't, it's not. And, and that's the same thing with this alien theory. We couldn't test that. But the only other theory that fits all of the data points that everyone agrees on, skeptics, Christians, everyone, is that Jesus Christ did raise from the dead. And if that's true, he is God. And if he's God, what he says is true. And he told us that now our sins are washed away and we can be in fellowship with God again. We can enjoy his fellowship together in the presence of the only infinitely and perfectly loving being there is for the rest of eternity. So if, if, if you run into skeptics, people that want to challenge your beliefs, you have a tool that he doesn't rely on you preaching to them, you know, Bible thumping or anything like that. You could just ask them, well, what? or challenge them, say, look, the most radical skeptics agree on certain historical facts. They're not in the, you know, they're not out of the Bible. They're extra biblical. And even those show that our faith is true. So be encouraged. Anyway, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, for, for doing everything you do in a way that we can see that you are indeed God and that you do love us and that you have, you know, washed away our sins. You have accepted us exactly as we are, the wretched, sinful condition we are in, and you have reconciled us to you if we will believe in your Son. And we ask you to, to let us be always encouraged and to overcome every doubt we have and to share this good news with everyone we have a chance to and, and to use whatever tools we have that you have given us to propagate your truth. In your name, Jesus. Amen.